Hello everyone, I'm Gemma Starr and welcome to another episode of Man Speak. Man Speak is an offshoot to the Heart Warrior series where some of our Heart Warriors come back and um, we talk about a whole subject uh, that they are passionate about. Um, and today is no exception because uh, we have the return of our number 24 heart warrior who is Sasha Stone and uh, we're going to be talking about poetry. Now Sasha is uh, a brilliant mind, he's an architect, a geometer of our emerging new earth uh, but he's also a divine poet and um, amazing wordsmith. And for those who don't know me, I also write poetry. So uh, this is going to be a fascinating discussion and one very close to both of our hearts. So enjoy. Hey, Sasha, welcome back to Man Speak. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Great pleasure. Thank you. It's a bit of a, a drizzly day here in Istanbul. I'm just on my way to the airport uh, to head to Romania in um, just after this interview I'll, I'll be running out the door but very happy to catch up with you oh amazing thank you and the subject for today is poetry one which I know is close to your heart and mine so um and the the title that you chose was surfing the space between words and I'd just like to start by reading the first four uh, lines of one of your poems which talks about this and so we arrive at that place between words where nothing is said yet everything heard so what is that space between words it's the it's the uh, it's the still point it's the um it's the transcendent um axis um from the from the lateral plane into the um into the vertical, into the ascendancy, so to speak. It's the um, it's the touchstone of the beloved, which is the marriage point of alpha omega of all aspects of duality. Um, it couldn't be more profound. Uh, the, having said that, the door's just gone because my lunch has just arrived. So uh, talk about space between words. This is also a space between words. It won't take longer than five seconds. But by all means, read some poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just pause. Did you have anything else to say around that session? No, I think I covered the entire universal um, fabric of, of uh, creation. Uh, in that in that no alpha omega it's all that is all that ever was all that ever shall be and that that's why for me the it's the perennial theme it's the theme that uh, re reemerges and reemerges uh, through poetry and the reason why i'm so um devoted and to some extent addicted to poetry is because that is the beginnings of a language which takes us away from the um uh, from from suffrage you know in the, in the temporal space into into the transcendent which is where we no longer identify with with um time and motion um, but we situate ourselves within the throne of witness which doesn't feel pain because it doesn't identify with anything it simply observes in a non judgmental and non-condemnatory way um all that exists and that that's really the closest we get to being um fully aligned with with the godhead with divinity and that's why uh, for me um poetry is important because it brings us to that to that still point yeah, I mean, this conversation came up for us in our last uh, episode of Man Speak, and I re-listened to the bit that you were saying about poetry, and um, you said to me, poetry is is a very important uh, transmutation and to some extent tran transcendent medium. I would say the most important. So, I mean, I know you're a sculptor and an artist and a musician, but you're saying poetry is the most important. Why is that? By far. There's no question about that. I, I cut my hands off, cut everything else off. But don't um, but don't don't disassociate me from 
the imperative of um, finding the space between words vital. Um, words are expression, the accreted um, grunts and squawks that we make in order to express soul in in the luciferic realm of time space and in this realm we're seeking to um we're seeking to elevate ourselves and others we're seeking to we're seeking to um to conjure and to alchemize um the baseline of our reality into a higher outcome and use our life force and and our our expression as the medium to do so nothing could be more important and when you've arrived at um poetry and you understand the use of syntax and and placement of word or situation of word and of meaning um where it's no longer the word it's the space between the words that actually enchants and that um that does the conjuring i don't want to get lost in the words describing wordlessness here and i'm about to do so and i'll fall over backwards but um i hope that what i've said um elicits the 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 importance of poetry because to me it is profoundly important i'll i'll put it this way and and bad poets should be lined up and shot i've said this for, uh, for, from day 1 there's no excuse for bad poetry but i guess practice poetry is acceptable but do it really on your own and then only come forward when or well, don't even come forward i i don't come forward i kind of spit poetry into the into the wind and most of my poems 90% of them um uh just curl up and roll up and and dissolve into nothingness so i don't collect my even my own poems don't matter to me once they've been writ um it's not that one you know wants to create an anthology of poetry particularly it's the business of writing the poem of being in that um in that uh, space in the writing of it is the gifting of the frequency let's let's talk about frequency words of frequency expression is frequency everything is frequency and i think that poetry is the last step toward um the psionic and the telepathic um um actualization of the human spirit in the temporal realm i think that we'll all be poets moments before we move into the collective enlightenment into the vertical ascension event which is coming uh, i think that the, the eve of that we will all be poets we will all be thinking and feeling and um and um confluencing within the realm of poetry to my mind that's for sure what happens is what happens to people on the eve of their death um people who are just about to depart this world move into a very very um profound prophetic um kind of reductivist approach to life everything gets pulled into the now and the use of breath and words becomes so so very important anyone who's been at the deathbed of someone <clears throat> knows what i'm saying it becomes the most important uh, use of uh, of word you know famous last words are famous for a reason because they're gen generally the most important words that are ever spoken so sasha did you study poetry like can you give us a bit of a background to uh your your relationship with poetry no i've never studied anything in that sense um no i, I haven't and 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 I don't know that there's such a thing as studying poetry, but I'm I'm more or less familiar with with poetry. I've, I've familiarized myself with with great poets, especially in my in my teens and early twenties. You know, I did some reading at that time. I stopped reading a long time ago and haven't read subsequent to that. Um, and I've never bought a book of poetry to speak of. But, you know, William Blake was a very, very impactful on me as a as a youngster, as a child. Um, Ezra Pound was very, very important uh, to me um, as a child. And I could I could cite uh, two or three hundred poets if I sat with it for long enough. 
um and there are so so many i mean the 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 the, the family of of poets is um that we could refer i mean i looked up earlier today before this conversation with you i wanted to just refresh myself as to who are the most um important poets in history now of course surprise surprise in google up comes a bunch of white poets you know <laughs> that's it you know there was one black face of course that was maya angelo but you know, starts off with William Shakespeare, somebody who, by best accounts, didn't even exist. You know, uh, Walt Whitman, um, a kind of central tenet to the to M Middle America today. William Wordsworth, you know, a seminal icon to Middle England today. Uh, William Blake, um, a seminal influence in the transcendent um, uh, uh, milieu of moving from. Uh, Victoriana into into uh, the next expression at the collective level. So William Blake became very axiomatic as a poet, um, uh, uh, you know, not just in England, but around the world. Edgar Allan Poe, similarly, and Mark Twain in, in the United States become seminal, you know, poets in the same context. Uh, John Keats and John Milton sort of pre precursors to William Blake, very, very important poets. And like I said, Ezra Pound, to me, vital um, man ended up in a in a mental asylum, you know, having been put there by the status quo, because his poetry ultimately was the the best kind of poetry. It was it was so revolutionary. It was challenging the fabric of of the day, and and to an extent that he inflamed um, the sensibilities of people enormously. Um, Maya Angelou very important American black poet. Um, I don't really forgive her for fawning over Barack Obama and buying into that liberalist shit, but um, God forgive her. She was an old woman and can be forgiven for that. Um, and, and so goes on Sylvia Plath, characters like her and Dylan Thomas, you know, the kind of Welsh poets who were, who were shock poets, important important poets but tragic comic i mean their lives were were devastated rack and ruin oscar wilde um also very important man an icon um who died in <laughs> who died in ignominy in a in a fucking um hotel somewhere in the outer fringes of paris you know from some sexually transmitted disease i think it was and God love Oscar Wilde, you know, um, such an incredible wordsmith. Even the last words he uttered were just should echo throughout eternity. I think the last words, <laughs> the last words he uttered as he looked up from his deathbed in this ghastly little hotel room, he said, either the wallpaper goes or I go. <laughs> and of course, then he died, you know, and he was an aesthetician, a man who elevated beauty uh, above all things. Um, then you've got Yeats and Pablo Neruda, very, very important poet as well. These kind of revolutionary poets. You you talk about the most important um, revolutionary poet, to my mind, is Garcia Lorca, the Spanish revolutionary poet who's been also a huge uh, inspiration to me, um, what his life represented. He was such a such a threat to the status quo. They lined him up against a wall and shot him in the heart, you know, um, for his poetry. Uh, Rudyard um, Kipling, very important poet, again, uh, Kipling. And so it goes on and on and on. I mean, we could speak about, I could speak ad infinitum about um, poets in the last century. I don't, I'm not familiar with ones that were in medieval days. There was sort of doggerel poets there that set the standard of the day, but I can't really speak to them. What what I would do is is say that the greatest um, exemplar of of poet poetry that I can um, conjure would probably be Rumi, the great Sufic poet, and that's I think because because his prose and his poetry was so um distilled so refined so transcended that it cast uh, it cast effectively the um it, it cast the the thrall of an entire civilization and culture and religion you know islam es essentially emerges off the 
um, mystical traditions of Islam, which you could look to Sufism for. So Rumi becomes profoundly important as a as a poet. Do all those poets? Do all those poets like? Because I don't know most of them. The only one I studied at school was John Donne, a metaphysical poet, and for some reason I remember him. But um, like, do all those poets? Would you say are they writing poetry through their heart? Because we did talk a, a bit about this in the last show. The difference, like, we both agreed that when our poetry comes through, it comes through the heart, as opposed to you know writing a scholastic essay with the mind do all those poets would you say are they does poet good poetry is it does it always come through the heart and is it channeled through us or is it written by us so i'm going to just start off by disagreeing um and because in in a sense we're going back to the conversation that we had which i enjoyed on the subject but no good poetry doesn't come from the heart good poetry must um, issue from a synthesis of heart and mind and uh, again that's when the mind negates the uh, the intellect negates the emotionality and the emotionality negates the intellectuality and so when emotion and intellect come together in phase coherence which means to say balanced then they phase one another out and that becomes the transcendent point that becomes the conduit and the access point uh, to what you would call godhead or divinity or divine inspiration or aspiration and then yes then we get into the into the arena of or the discourse of is that is that a um am, am i am i am i doing it or am i channeling it which well uh, ultimately there's no difference or distinction between uh, the two uh, when you are fully being in the doing of the being of the doing of who you be and who you do in the now, um, then you are at that transcendent point. You're in that still point as a as an actualized human. And let's just touch on that for a moment, because it's the this is the point. And this is the point of this conversation, the point of the subject. It's the point of poetry itself is for us to arrive at that um, phase conjugate space between this and that between polarity and duality why was garcia Lorca's poetry so profound because the status quo of the day in 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 uh during the spanish revolution the powers that be couldn't couldn't touch it they couldn't tap into it they couldn't comprehend it for sure but they couldn't control it because the because the way that Garcia Lorca um, communicated through poetry was beyond the control of any culture or any standard of the day. That was the point, and that was why he was such a threat, and that was why the only way to deal with him was to kill him, which they did with a bullet through the heart. And why does Garcia Lorca's life exemplify the very best of revolutionaryism and the very best of poetry and the very best of, of mortal transcendence? It's because he lived, breathed and died uh, to the atom seed of that flame of pure truth which, as I've mentioned over the years, is connected to what he coined, something called duende or the duende line, which is the indivisible line upon which the angel and the devil do combat for the mortal soul. Think about that. The duende line is that indivisible line upon which the angel and the devil do more combat for the mortal soul. That's powerful stuff. That describes the essence of the angelic human being and our struggle and our trial of separation. It describes the battleground of the human heart and mind, the human being, the duende line. It describes the, 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 the place wherein we define pure truth, wherein we hear the chorus of our own conscience and wherein we re-identify with our own divinity and thereby have what it takes to move into our ascendancy whether it's in the mortal sense as becoming a better human being a more a more spiritualized being or whether indeed it's it's 
equipping ourselves for death and for moving into the next realm of expression in the most perfect way possible. So it's very, very important stuff. I don't want to wax on too long on the subject. I'm just trying to give a sense of, of rationale as to why poetry is so important. It defines culture. Ultimately, it defines reality. Love it. <laughs> so, Sasha, when you write poetry, because I, I want to, yeah, I want to understand if it's sort of the same as what happens with me. Like, do you, how does it, what are the moments, what's happening in the moments leading up to you writing a poem? So I'm schooled at songwriting and I did that for so many years from my teens or throughout my 20s until about 29, or I think was more or less when I when I retired from music. But for sure, there was a period of um, 12, 13 years where all I was uh, concerned about was um, was lyrics and lyricism and um, and situating prose with with music and um so i composed music and wrote and wrote the prose and th that was my discipline was um, songwriting um so i got to a a point i think or a plateau within my own um capacity to write poetry where it became very very second nature it's it's like if you if you do know how to play a violin you pick it up and you go straight into it um and and the, the the thing will will sing in your hands um, if you're good at it. But similarly, you practice enough in in lyrics and lyricism and poetry, and it ultimately entrains your mind into moving into that place of surrender where where the intellect is not trying to lead the process. Trust me, if the intellect tries to lead the process, you'll fuck it up and you'll fall over backwards. And it'll be what I define as bad poetry. And again, I say, take them out and shoot them for that. But the same thing with bad music, you know, bad, a bad sound, a bad song, a singer, a bad piece of musical composition is venal. It's it's the most horrendous thing. It's antithetical to the elevation of art or beauty or consciousness. It's actually a desecration of beauty, art, and consciousness. And all too many people have no idea how to compose or make music or write poetry or sculpt or paint. Um, and yet they afflict themselves and the world with bad poetry and bad music and bad um, images. So I don't I just have to try and draw a blind down and um, pay little attention to that. Then we could we could get into the realm of art and speak about, you know, everyone from Toulouse-Lautrec to Kandinsky. And what defines a good artist? What defines a good painter? What defines a good sculptor? Well, you know the answer to that. You move, you go to an art museum or you see the image of a, um, of a of a Turner painting, and if you're not moved by that, you are you are a subhuman. You do not have empathy or compassion, or you're not actualized if you can look at a Turner painting without being profoundly moved by it. Um, that's just a fact. That's just a fact. Um, so similarly with with poetry, the right stuff um, connects through frequencies. And those frequencies are all contained within what you would call the empathic waveform of frequency sets, because it's I am that thou art. A good poet speaks to the universal theme of the trial of separation. A good poet can only speak to the theme of the beloved and continuously play with that theme of identifying or re-identifying what the beloved is, who the beloved is. Um, let's just let's just go back in history a little bit. We discussed Rumi and Rumi with the Masnavi, which was a, a, a epic, uh, uh, I think a six volume series of uh, poetry, which was um, referred to by many as the Quran in, in Persian. But that's Rumi's most famous poem. And it's over 50,000 lines long. And all it does is teaches Sufis how to find love in 
devotion, in reverence, in, in their affinity to God. That's all it does. So it's a restatement. Again, an identification and a re-identification. It's a feedback loop that just constantly explores the thematic of the beloved. And it's that powerful. It became the genus point for an entire civilization. And with, with the master uh, Jesus or Yeshua, you've got coming from the man from Gethsemane's own lips, you could, you could ascribe I am the way, the truth, and the light, uh, and the life. Th so th that becomes the that becomes the seminal um, message of of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father except me. And so it goes on. But what he's essentially saying in poetry, in prose, there, again, epochal prose is, I am that I am, and claiming himself as the son of God, as all of us should do and must do, except for the idiot Christians who fell into idolatry and, and are addicted to doctrine and dogma. And they think that anyone saying I'm a son or a daughter of God is a heretic and should be shot or burned at the stake. So 98% plus of all Christians historically have been idolaters and continue to this day to be idolaters. 98% by best accounts of, of good, quote unquote, Muslims are themselves uh, heretics against the true, um, the true message of the prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, who was an extraordinary uh, being and who gave, elicited in the same way that the man from Gethsemane or Nazareth did, also elicited beautiful one-liners that codified the all of the what became the religion was codified just in a few words by these great masters these great saints but you take jesus for instance speaking about i am the way the truth and the light and then you've got the bastardization of of jesus's prose the complete bastardization of everything that was sacred um, in in the utterances of the man from Nazareth were codified then into, in the worst sense, by the Jesuits and the Jesuitical element, which is the Black Sabbatean um, genesis of evil that emerged through the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church. And they came out with um, um, uh, um, uh, ad majorum dei glo gloriam, I think, yeah, which was which was the Jesuit code for for the greater glory of God. For the greater glory of God, so not I am the way I embody, enact, and manifest as the Son of God or the daughter of God. No, for the greater glory of God, the Jesuits flipped it into that, which is idolatry. So they could say, for the greater glory of God, the holy war. Go that direction, chop off all their heads or for the greater good of God, um, let's, you know, systemically poison humanity with a genocidal agenda through the pharmaceutical industry, which incidentally is exactly what the Jesuits did uh, promise and pledge to do hundreds of years ago, which they've done. So do you see what I'm saying? Words become so, so important and how one sees and understands the space between words is where you define the truth between them. In Buddhism, you could look at the greatest teaching of Buddhism is simply put, if you find the Buddha on your path, kill him. So that one line emerges as being the single most important um, teaching about Buddhism, certainly in my view, as a, as a poet, because it's perfectly true that that one line perfectly distills Buddhism into what it should be, which is not pursuing idolatry. Thou shalt not pursue the idol and then have a statue of the Buddha and a bunch of beads and a bunch of mantras and mandalas that you start to worship in a ritualistic fashion, which has become Latter-day Buddhism. It's idolatry. Don't even start me on Hinduism, the very, most idolatrous religion on the face of the earth, and a very interesting one culturally, to be sure. So for me, you now get to what I have arrived at, which is pure truth and right action in the living moment is the path of least resistance to the highest outcome, always in all ways. And I define that line as my ultimate offering of poetry or prose, 
because I happen to know that that is the distillation of all that is judicious and righteous and godly about all the scriptures and the mystical traditions. I'm concerned about today, contemporaneously, today. This is my age, my era. I'm not a dead soul speaking. I'm a living soul speaking, as are you. And what we say matters. And the words that we use matter. But what matters more is the space between the words, because that's where the spirit flows. And that's where the frequency of our words either attracts or repels. Be sure of that. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that before I continue and, and, uh, and silence you all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was something else that you said in the last show. Um, I did write it down. You said you can't be a good poet if you have an ego, they don't go hand in hand. Can you expand on that, please, Sasha? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, I, I'll just underscore what I've been saying, but with a slight uh, change in trajectory. And an ego, uh, an egoist, is not able to express in 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 concert with divinity. It it can't happen. It's why it's why egos, um, God love them, become other kinds of animals in this world. Donald Trump is a classic example of it. Um, he's a, an extraordinary man and one that I personally love. Um, I, a couple of things I don't forgive, which I've spoken about, the you know, vaccine agenda and so on. Don't understand that shit. But but um, I love the character. I love the man. And there's nothing I condemn about him. Um, there's nothing I would judge or condemn, um, but but similarly with, with with other other men, you know, of of his of his ilk, but he is not a poet. Be sure of that. He's many things, but he's not a poet. Um, Elon Musk is another latter day icon, and um, he's very brilliant in his way. He's anything but a poet. He's not a poet. Um, he's profound in some of the things he says, and his, his syntax is certainly very, um, very enlightened oftentimes, but he's not a poet. So the greatest ac accomplishes uh, in the world invariably are, are not poets per se, you know. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm approaching the, the answer to, uh, to your question. Um, forgive me. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, so when you write poetry, Sasha, I mean, I was thinking about why when I write poetry and I thought there's usually three reasons. Either I'm processing something because I'm feeling emotional turmoil and I take it to that zero space and just express it. Or I'm wanting to say something to someone else that I can't maybe say in another way. And so I write it in poetry or I want to capture a moment in time, immortalize a moment in time. What about you? it's uh, in me it's always going to be again um a, a regurgitation of the same thematic which is the relationship my relationship with the beloved and of course um if if one is if one is in love for instance and the object of desire especially unrequited love is the greatest um catalyst for poetry no question about that a broken heart is an essential catalyzing factor uh, for good poetry and and but that's because the the broken heart is is uh, symptomatic and totemistic of the death of ego um how do we have our hearts broken well through unrequited love which means that she left me because she doesn't love me anymore or he left me because he doesn't love me anymore therefore uh, i'm not good enough and i'm i'm lacking and and you know self worth comes up and all the horrors of of not being relevant and not being rich enough or beautiful enough or you know um all those 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 uh, elements enter in to become the confluence that brings about a destruction of ego, which is ultimately a very good thing. So then the ego falls into this abyss. Well, if, if it's a sensible one, it dies to itself. If it's a stupid ego, it'll simply resort to um, more uh, drink and drugs and um, addictions in order to blindside itself from its own from its own shadow. But the sensible um, individual dies a death through the broken heart, becomes a kind of pedestrian shamanic um, ritual. And we've all suffered from that. Most uh, 13, 14, 15 year olds suffer from it. And it hurts badly at that 
time. I can tell you it doesn't get any better with age. Um, heartbreak is heartbreak is heartbreak. But one one does write, you're right, one, one does elicit poetry um, as a means of communicating to the other, invariably the beloved. But that's, again, that's not really ground zero of the poetry because ground zero is not connected to the icon of the unrequited love ground zero is when we've transposed the folly of the heartbreak or the unrequited love we've transposed that in as a fractal of the greater heartbreak which is the trial of separation of the whole of humanity the great fall so to speak which is the which is the primal trauma or so we're engineered genetically and psycho civilizationally to believe in a in a great fall and so there's that which becomes the genesis point of our sense of loss and sense of sorrow um and sense of um unrequited um connection to divinity you're right but the fractal is the fractal and it's not ground zero of poetry ground zero is when we when we fall into the the atom seed of the human experience the human condition and we truly the heart breaks the true heart the rose heart the heart of the magdalene when that heart the christed heart that's the one that needs to break in a sense and ground zero is where that heart, I don't want to say break, it opens up. It opens up. But the process of of getting there is the greatest sacrifice any of us can make because we have to move beyond temporal love, love of the, the spouse or the, the beloved husband, wife, lover. That story becomes folly. We've now entered into the great heart of humanity where all suffrage of all children is my suffrage with the suffrage of war and disease and poverty of all beings all sentient beings is my suffrage is my great pain and then one's poetry and the space between the words of one's poetry really begins simply to position itself there not in order to re constantly reprogram but in in order to in order to put out the words that can be heard in the great desolation by others because there's nothing more lonely than loneliness and you know true loneliness when we're sitting in that in that space and the loved one has died or life is reduced now down just to the bare bones and all of the, the color and the um, superfluity of life has now been threshed away. All that's left is the bare bones. I'm describing now everyone's journey toward death. Okay. I'm describing everyone's journey through the death of a beloved a husband or a wife a lover a son a daughter a mother a father when the bare bones are left all we want to feel is not alone because i know you've written about bones let me find that one because i was going to read that one later but we should maybe this one Okay, can I read it? Please. I hope I do justice. I had to choose ones that had words I could pronounce. <laughs> so I didn't want to butcher any of your poems. So, Fate, my love. Do you recall that time I told you we would plant a forest where you might rest in peace? Yet I see that it is my bones which are to be buried deep in the heart of this forest tonight. Well, well, well chosen poem, incidentally, because yes, 
that actually underscores exactly what I've just been speaking about is that um, my bones um, is the bones of the ego. And once, once my bones have been buried in the forest, um, I've moved into that transcendent uh, space. The fear of, of uh, fear is fear is fear. And fear is only something which emerges um, in connection to the absence of what we call love. Um, and love is, is what we what we define through relationship with self because it is only when we have um, aligned relationship with self that we are become capacitors of what you would call love which is um, which is the universal stream that um, that keeps all sentience moving but to become conscious of it um, whilst, in the flesh is the is the essential piece here that's where we can move into higher strains of expression like bliss um serendipity um where where we become so um, convergent with the godhead that our living expression becomes an instrument or an extension of of um, alpha omega of divine expression and when one is aligned in that way and then one can see the results i mean in one's life so ultimately i think i'm describing what each of us seek which is beyond just finding relevancy yeah we all want relevancy we all want to matter we all want a voice. We all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. But the greatest amongst us arrive at a point where being seen is absolutely of no consequence, where being heard is of no consequence. Um, because in the temporal world, the temporal realm, to be heard and to be seen is to be part of a Luciferic exchange of false light worship. I know what I'm talking about here. The whole business of uh, being a, a a rock and roll um, musician and 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 moving into that world of of iconoclasticism in my youth, and then um, over the years um, becoming something of a kind of influencer type. Um, I don't know how what you would describe my my remit in life, but it's definitely got to do with people's attention to what I say. So that's the exchange there. And I have to police that exchange constantly. I have to constantly police it, lest I fall foul and fall victim to the travesty, the abomination of idolatry and allowing that exchange to become something which empowers me with false light, which would be devastating to me. And so again, poetry is my way of keeping myself in check and i'll tell you straight up if i start to put pen or prose to paper and there's a block that is symptomatic of an egoic form in myself an intellectual um, aggrandizement that is now acted as an obstacle to that fluid um, communion and so that's my way of knowing so i take serious stock and check of self at that moment if if there's not absolute um fluid uh, alignment through 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 prose so again a useful barometer for um keeping oneself in in check the problem today or oh, there's many problems one could speak of but um one of the most um prevailing ones is the um the adherence to false light the addiction uh, that it's created amongst swathes of younger generations who are seeking relevancy only through the most facile interfacing with social media so um sticking my tits out and sticking my tongue out you know as a 14 year old girl or you know 
or a, a boy kind of strutting and punching another kid in the face in the schoolyard and posting that. Those are the, we discussed this briefly in our last conversation about, about porn stars and cage fighters exemplifying the fallen female and the fallen male. And ironically, it's the, it's these pornographicized young girls, whether they are, whether they are, um, um, you know, um, Britney Spears or whether they are, um, uh, these cage fighters. I'm so out of that uh, ilk. I don't even, I can't even name one of them. Um, but the, the point being, they've become the icons of millions and millions of younger generations just look up to them. Even though all they're doing is playing into the most bestial um, element of our nature, which is satanic. But it's beyond Luciferic. It's satanic. It's Saturnian logic. It's flipped 180 degrees. And that's become the premise of how we are culturally um, or cultivating uh, our younger uh, people into, into life against um, the grain of what I would bring forth, which is poetry. So I would reduce all teaching. I would eradicate 98% of all teaching, all learning. I plan to do it. Incidentally, we're just beginning work on the zero point curriculum of the New Earth School that or I, we won't even be using that term that we plan to build uh, next year. And I'm uh, beginning the process of developing that zero point um, curricula. What does it look like? How do we how can we best be stewards or custodians, uh, ushers to young souls, bringing them into this world? and helping them helping them stave off that tidal wave of pornography and of trivia and of false light egoism that otherwise they're being invited into in every aspect of their lives that becomes a profoundly important question and one that i am very very um serious about and it's got to do with again poetry so we'll be bringing younger people into reconvention with nature through telluric and paramagnetic and dielectric forces um, taking them back to reconnection with the sacred soil the living soil and then also the space between words and reconvention of relationship with each other and with um, instructors or stewards or custodians or teachers or experts whoever's brought in to help uh, exemplify arts and sciences and crafts that's got to be a, a relationship that's complete or based on pure equanimity and balance it cannot be a student teacher relationship this is a perversion and so it goes on um i'm going off in a slightly different direction except to say that um the most important aspect of that curriculum will be understanding um or being in a state of witness in order that the space between words is heard more presciently and more powerfully than the words themselves. So good. Okay, let's read another poem. <laughs> so this one, um, I think it's, oh, okay. At the edge of time, near the end of days, where the angle of light can blind the gaze, and the cross that we bear is our fate foretold, for the pain that we feel is the love we withhold. Love in a tempest. I love those last two lines, Sasha, for the pain that we feel is the love we withhold. Well, I, that was stolen, and um, that's why I think I wrote the poem. I've not heard it since I wrote it. It sounds it sounds fluid. It's an, it's an honest it's an honest piece of prose, um, but that that that's a, a beautiful um, saying that um, I heard, which comes from the Andromedan constellation, the Andromedan uh, beings who that's their gift to humanity is the pain that you feel is the love that you withhold. And in that, again, that's Andromedan poetry and it's poetry at its finest. Because in one li line, one breath, one utterance, one understands redemption and salvation at the same time. 
the pain that I feel is the love that I withhold. That is just redeemed me from my sorrow, from my misery, from feeling alone. It's not about me. It was never about me. I must let go of the idea of me and simply recognize the universal truth that we only feel pain proportionate to the degree to which we are failing to fill the space with love and with affirmation and with the elevation again of art and beauty and consciousness, which is what should be, we should all be afflicted by that. That should be our addiction and our affliction, should be affirming and creating and expanding incessantly. That's what we are hardwired to be and to do. We are, we are Godhead made manifest in the temporal realm where capacitors of limitless um, genius and supernature and divine flame and when we're not being harvested and harnessed and mind fucked by uh, lower elemental intelligences and arconic and demonic forces um, that operate also through temporal proxies in this world aka politicians and bankers and priests when we get rid of the third party interventionism um, and move into our true flow, each one of us, even the hardest bastard out there who's listening to this, who's such a tough guy that it's hard for him to even listen to a podcast about poetry. You are touched by it for a reason. You lean in to hear this for a reason. You know, I know that what I'm saying resonates with hard men because I, I happen to love hard, strong men more than any other kind of man. I like tough guys. I like gun-toting farmers and veterans and men who who have softened and feminized their spirit having gone through the fight of 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 men and survived they are my favorite creature the feminized the male that's defining now his heart and his uh, his femin feminized aspect i regard myself to some extent as being one of those creatures um, I think I used to be a lot harder than I am nowadays. <laughs> I wasn't as soft. <laughs> <laughs> you found your heart. <laughs> I know I was always there. I mean, my my heart. I've never, I never needed to find the heart. My my affliction, uh, Gemma, was that I was born in that space and 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 died to it a thousand times since the age of five you know and uh, i think maybe we may have even touched on that you know so i've never been out of sync with uh, with that piece but um yeah yeah anyway don't i don't dwell on myself okay so i have another one <laughs> and i'd really like to understand this one um the first couple of lines and the last couple of lines especially a king without a kingdom a rose without a thorn the dream within a dream, within a never-ending storm. A sigh within a tempest, a wheel within a wheel. The pulse within a vein, within a heart which daren't feel. Listen close, O brazen heart, for aught it may be worth. A king without a kingdom is king of all the earth. Good poem. I rather <laughs> like that. Again, I've not heard it um since i wrote it and i don't know how long ago i wrote it um 2019 but, um, okay that's for three 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 odd years ago um don't know what to say but speaking again to to the same to the same uh thematic of um alpha omega and of defining one's relevancy in this world through defining one's divine flame and aligning to that divine flame and again you could be sitting in the most um, miserable and dejected and ignominious circumstances, absolutely stone broke, living in some shithole of a place. Um, and this truth comes to you. And when this truth comes to you in that condition, in that circumstance, and some people listening in to this are going to be in a pretty um, grim circumstance, you know, of, 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 of poverty and of, um, sorrowfulness and of a sense of dejection and yet when they do define their godliness and their supernature their divine flame in that space 
of poverty and dejection, the empowerment that floods into the veins and how that turns everything around. And that's not to say that to be poor or sick or miserable is, is an affliction or is a punishment. It's, it's not. It's what we do to ourselves. It's how we, it's how we refract and reflect the geometry of life back to self in order to bring ourselves into these quint these these quintessential um, moments of defining self in the now, in order to constantly invite a reconvention of relationship with our divinity in the now, and when we're when we've hurt enough, we get to the point where we do meet with self in a perfect moment in time. And that moment of time, of course, as I've said a thousand times, becomes the springboard to timelessness. And timelessness describes the transmutation and then transcendence from the mortal realm of time and motion and fear and money and scarcity and entropy and death. We move in that moment of timelessness into our supernature, into the state of witness, which is beyond birth and death, beyond good and evil, beyond the angelic and the demonic. It becomes the perennial witness. And that's where we're all seeking to take our throne, because that's the one quantum zone where we can never feel sorrow again, never feel alone again, never feel ignominious or unworthy again and surely that's what we're all seeking ultimately is the throne of self which is why the true message of the true master jesus uh, in the christian context is i am i am the i am is absolutely essential is to take full cognizance full authorship full uh, um, sovereign um, responsibility for the alphabet of one's own heart and for the architecture of one's own reality. And whilst we're speaking about poetry and the importance of it, because also my, I've got to shoot in three minutes, one of the most important things um, people wouldn't necessarily understand this. I do as a poet get this is mathematics because mathematics is a transcendent language now i've got the attention of um en engineers and scientists who are leaning in now go ah the boy gets it yeah i do get it i totally get it pure mathematics is so transcendent and so powerful cannot begin to express my admiration for true math and I know that for me, I've spoken about um, the Andromedan poetry and the poetry of Garcia Lorca, the poetry of, uh, of the Master Yeshua and of Rumi um, and others being so important to me. I can tell you that in terms of my own shamanic death and rebirth, and uh, the evolution of my own soul's journey in this world, it was not attributable to the poetry of any of those great avatars. It was attributable to the equation by a very, very brilliant Belgian mathematician uh, whose name was Bernalt Mandelbrot, who died, alas, a few short years ago. But Bernard Mandelbrot stumbled on an equation, which was Z equals Z square plus C. That in 1997, which is when I had my complete shamanic death and rebirth, was, um, was what saved me, what, what redeemed me and brought me out of madness back into the land of the living, so to speak. I went so deep into sorrow at that time in that year that the only thing that saved me was me being cast into the quantum void, drowning in the emeraldine oceans of despair to such an incredible point of agony where the agony accreted into a universal truth that emerged in my mind's eye 
in my space of madness and suffrage at that time. And all that emerged was an equation. And it was just that. It was Z equals Z squared plus C. How's that? I then found out later that that equation was the equation um, circumscribed by a man called Bernard Mantelbrot, which became the saw, the root to all um, supercomputers today. So I'd, I'd entered into, through my sorrow, I'd entered into the atom seed of the matrix. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, any mathematician who knows Z equals Z squared plus C describes the equation of infinity. That's what it is. But I only found that out weeks later when I came back with this equation, was asking around, does anyone know what this means? When I could walk and talk properly after my um, momentary madness. And it was uh, explained to me at a given point. And that was a huge eureka moment that um, that was the equation of infinity. So at that point, I recognized that I had done the shamanic death to such an extent that you could not die any further. I would have disembodied at that point. But what I came back with, the jewel that was in, in burned into me was the universal equation of infinity. So sorry to go on on this subject, but I just want to underscore here that poetry is not just, you know, long haired hippies and, and, and losers like myself writing pretty words that do their best to conjure. That's not poetry. That's not what I'm talking about. The space between words is also the space between numbers. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an important subject, this, that you kindly and graciously reached out to me to, to communicate on. Um, poetry is so much more. The greatest equations ever written are absolute poetry in motion as well. Let's not forget that. So fascinating because, you know, you can articulate things so well, like all these concepts I've never heard of. I just write and, you know, express. But, you know, to, to actually have the theory and everything around it is um, is massive. So well, that is the point. That's the point of uh, poetry. Again, you, you beautifully bring me back to, to this, the point of transcendence, which is the point of alchemization, is to be connected to supernature in the now, which is to be connected to the Alpha Omega, the universal mind in the now, which knows the answers to all things at all times in all ways and can speak limitlessly on any subject. When each of us align to that um, extraordinary propensity that we have of alignment with our divinity, we can all engage ad nauseum with endless fascination because the truth of the matter is that it is endlessly fascinating. The heart of reality is extraordinarily uh, beautiful and complex and uh, profound and magical and mysterious and infinitely enchanting. And again, that's where we should be situating our minds and our hearts, uh, not on whether we can, you know, make the tax bracket this year or whether we can, you know, get with the desired, um, you know, lover or whether we can, you know, acquire a Chihuahua or a Pomeranian uh, in, at Christmas time. Whatever our little fetishes are, we, we really ought to move so much beyond them into our limitless capacitance as divine sons and daughters of God and therein find true expression and true bliss and true affirmation and true ecstasy. That's the real orgasm. Yeah, right there. Yeah, I mean, the writing and the poetry, it really is. I feel connected with the angels and heaven and div divinity and, you know, everything else that comes through and really takes takes us to, um, to a higher place. Um, so I'll read another one. This was, I think this was one of your more recent ones. I stumbled on a part of me like driftwood on the shore. Mine hollowed heart, full cleft apart, was stilled forevermore. And through the gloaming I espied, lain broken as a bird. Mine song now dead, all meaning shed, a stiller sound not heard. I stumbled on a part of me, eternal me amore. Where fell this life to Hera's knife, alone. <laughs> I 
cephalopod. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know what it is. I love that the last it line. It's, it's a headless statue, cephalopod. Oh. Yes, yes. It, well, yes, I was re referring to I was referring to an ancient icon there. Um, the saint that carries around its own a cephalophore carries its own head around with it. Um, it. It's just that that's just totemistic of the of the ultimate sacrifice that that we make in this world as a Christed being or as a shaman, uh, as a healer, as a mother. Um, as a true lover, as a true father, as a true brother, as a true sister, any of us who are a true anything um, are saintly in in that being. So whoever you are, wherever you are, in whatever circumstances you live, um, if you align to the frequencies of, of what we're speaking about here, it means that simply put, you are accomplished, that you have arrived and that you um, whether your your role could be playing the crone, you know, could be the wizened old crone. And that's a beautiful, powerful archetype um, that um, some elders are profoundly intelligent enough to align to that um, archetype and then embody that archetype and become uh, extraordinary vessels for wisdom and learning of others. The point I'm making is that everyone is so relevant and so vital and so valid in this world, even the motherfuckers amongst us, um, the, the the real shady nasties. I've spoken about the Fauci's and the Gateses of this world being Zen masters in their way, which they are. And when we can see that, we're seeing the poetry of life right there. And more than that, we're seeing the word but the spaces between the words in the poetry of life, when we can recognize that everything is comprised in that sense of perfect divine geometry. All the horrors of this world are there for a perfectly anointed reason. Nothing is happenstance. Nothing is just haphazard. Everything is perfectly aligned in the now. So good. Okay, this one's from 2018. It'll have to be the last one, darling, because I have to run to the airport in four minutes, five minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll read it quickly, but then I also wanted to read the one that you inspired me to write at the end. So if you could just leave a couple of minutes for that. Okay. Uh, so this one um, you wrote in 2018. I dreamt we met beneath a tree, long overgrown with mystery, wetted by galactic tears, where it had stood for many years, and there we kissed each other's eyes and thus became immortalized. I like this yeah. idea of people being immortalized in poetry. Again, the theme there is of the beloved. Who's the beloved? The beloved is me, was me and my relationship with me and me one fine day, having the the, the courage, the steel to to face off self and to to deal with the shadow in that sense and to be able to hold the gaze with oneself unflinchingly which is to say to realign fully with one's own conscience in the now and one's own divinity in the now and to become completely peaceable about that relationship when nothing is uncomfortable any longer and where it is, we address it, we adjust it accordingly. But that poem speaks about, again, um, the immortalization um, of, of one's relationship with oneself and becomes the divine spark. And then enters into something which the the ancient uh, sadhus would refer to as, or the, even, the, even the modern sadhus would refer to as the bodhisattva, which is the state of um, availing oneself to be of service uh, to others. And one can escape this world because one has already earned the stripes, so to speak, to be able to do so, but you choose to uh, remain and you choose to continue to be of service to others. Um, and that becomes your metier, that becomes your reason for being, is simply to remain in service that that ultimately that state of bodhisattva is the highest calling of the actualized human being yeah thank you 
So when I was getting ready for um, this show about a week ago, I printed off your poetry and I, I sat down to read it all. And about halfway through reading it, I had to stop because I had a poem come through myself. And I mean, literally, I just wrote it down. It, it just, when it flows, it flows, as you said. And I always like, if someone's inspired some of my, any of my poetry, I always like to send it to them, which, so I did. <laughs> but I'd also like to read it here because um, it's about your poetry. And when I feel that it comes through like that, I feel that it is meant to um, um, be shared with the person who inspires it. So it's called His Chest. You handed me a chest, a sacred treasure trove of words wrapped up in your heartache, sorrows and woes. I opened the lid and peeked there within, beyond the glaring gold nuggets, past what mortals can know. Bedazzled by your jewels, feeling the depth of your words, hearing the music of angels, gracing hearts here on earth. The holy alchemy of poetry, divine transcendence of rhyme, pure vibrations from heaven sung between lyrics and line. Not all are yet to see you, not all can yet know the purity of love etched in the poetry of your soul. That's very wonderful. And uh, you, you shall be spared assassination um, because that was a good poem. <laughs> so... <laughs> I felt a bit like the lamb to slaughter because I know you're a brutal poetry critic, but I know it was came from that divine space. So I was happy to put myself on the on the Thank slaughter. <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. Much appreciated. Very lovely words. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Sasha, for for telling us all your beautiful words about poetry and for allowing me to read your beautiful words and the space between the words. Great fun. Thank you, Jim. I look forward to the next time. God bless you. Safe travels. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, I'll be back um, on Manspeak in another couple of days. Okay, bye.